Hi guys and welcome to a new lesson where we are going to get a grip on localization. So understanding localization. Localization is the, is the name given to the various actions required to make a computer application usable in different localities. That includes such features as time zone differences, date and time formatting, currency symbols, numeric formatting, and of course, language differences. In extreme cases, it might require a new UI layout to take account of reading directions, such as right to left. Your computer operating system likely has many of these features controlled by a configuration setting, usually created when the operating system is first installed. <coughs> installed. Most users never change this setting and therefore take it for granted and never think about it. As a programming, as a programmer, your code may have to run on different computers, each with potentially different localization options. In this section, we will learn about how Python provides supports for localization through the use of locales and the Unicode character set. A locale is simply a code value that indicates a standardized group of localized settings, time zone, date format, currency, and so on. Unicode is an international standard for representing characters in different alphabets, for example, Latin, Arabic, Chinese, and so on, as well as different symbols such as punctuation marks and math. Unicode is very well in that it enables you to use different alphabets, but how do you translate the strings used in your application into different languages? That process is known as internationalization. There is a standard industry process for th this using a mechanism called GetText that generates language-specific files containing mappings from your embedded strings to the different languages language versions. Python supports this mechanism, mechanism via the GetText module. Localization includes the ability to select the correct string translation using GetText. So using locates, uh, Python supports different locales via the locale module. The way the module works, it's uh, quite complex and uses a layered approach. However, mostly you don't need to know about that. You can use a very small subset and generally you pick up the correct locale for your user. When your program starts, it usually sets uh, set the C locale by default, although that, that may not always be the case and lo local configuration settings may have changed it. However, you usually want to set the locale that your user ha cho has chosen. The way to do that is to call the locale dot set locale function, which an empty locale with, with an empty locale argument. This causes the system locale to be selected. <clears throat> Most of the time, that's all you need to do. You are strongly recommended to do this only once in your program and to do so near the start of your code. You can then use locale.getLocale to fetch the local details if you need to find out what has been set up. You will see that in the, in the, in, in an example. Unfortunately, setting the locale is not the end of story. If you want that change to take effect, there are some changes you need to make to your code. Specifically, there are some type conversions and comparison operations that are not locale aware in the standard library and built-in functions. To get around that, the lo locale module provide alternatives. And in other cases, the standard functions do understand locales if you give them the right hints. For example, the time.strf time function can format times to the locale local style if you use the appropriate formatting specifications such as percentage x for the localization localized date and percentage capitalized x for the localized time similarly to print numbers in 
uh, uh, similar to the print function numbers in the lo uh, locale specific format you need to specify the n style instead of the d or f or g in the string format method so let's try that out with with the, our in the interpreter i'll just restart the interpreter So repeating those in a SIGWIN session set to the EN underscore GB locale, we can see some differences. And I am not in that um, time zone. So this example shows how you work with locales. And the next topic is using Unicode in Python. Computers store data as binary numbers. Characters are mapped into these numbers so that when the computer prints a string of character characters, it maps the numeric data in memory so uh, to uh, to a set of characters representations on screen. Back in the dawn of computing, characters were represented by as few as five bits and more commonly using seven or eight bits. All of these encodings could fit into a single 8-bit byte of storage. So it was very compact. Unfortunately, a single byte can only cater to 256 different combinations, which is fine for the Latin alphabets used in the Western nations where modern computing originated, but nowhere near enough for all the alphabets in the world as a whole. Over time, each country and corporation invented its own encoding system and software engineers had to write lots of code to cater to these if their software was to be used in different localities. The solution was a Unicode standard. Unicode is a 32-bit uh, a, uh, a character catalog that can store a huge number of possible characters. Unicode characters are represented by entities called code points that are the numeric values that map onto characters. Code points are described using the format U plus 4xs. The U plus indicates that it is a Unicode code point and the 4xs is the hexadecimal number representing the location of the code point in Unicode. And there can be up to four hex digits, not just four. Code points are then mapped to characters that also have descriptive names. Thus, the character A is listed as U plus 0041 Latin capital letter A. The Python, the Python representation of the Unicode encoding is slash U and four X's for four digits or U or slash capital U and 8 X's for H8 digits, which is a fairly obvious translation of the Unicode format, uh, simply replacing U plus with slash U or slash capital U. The codes and names can all be found on the Unicode website at 
unicode.org slash public slash unidata slash name list dot txt. It is a important to realize that Unicode defines the character only, not its appearance. What you see as a character on your computer screen or printed out on paper is known as a glyph, which is a graphical representation of that character in some font or other. Unicode does not specify the font family, weight size, weight, size or any other details about appearance. appearance only the actual character. The Unica Unicode data has to be stored on the computer as a set of bytes that, as you recall, can only store values from 0 to 255. The simplest translation or encoding of Unicode is known as UTF-32 and is a one-to-one -one mapping of the Unicode code point value to a 32-bit number. This is simple to understand, but requires four bytes for every character, making it very memory and bandwidth hungry. To conserve space, two, uh, space two other uh, encodings are used. UTF-16 uses 16-bit blocks to represent most characters, but but with an option to extend that to two. 16-bit uh, blocks for some rarely used characters. Microsoft Windows uses UTF-16 by default. And one note is that uh, the extension in UTF-16 is known as uh, surrogate and it is indicated by a block containing the value in the range of for example 0xd800-0xdfffff and UTF-8 uh, UTF uses a different scheme whereby if a byte has a value greater than 128 and than 128 it indicates that it is part of a multibyte sequence UTF-8 stores the most commonly used characters in a 8-bit block but can be extended to use 2, 3 or four blocks for less commonly used characters. This makes UTF-8 the most compact form format if you are using the right set of characters, specifically in specifically the Latin alphabet. UTF-8 also has the convenient feature of uh, having the original ASCII characters set at as its lowest set of bytes, making interworking with older non-Unicode applications much easier. And UTF-8 is the default encoding for Python version 3. And the final note on localization and this uh, section is uh, using GetText. To translate your program strings using the GetText mechanism, there is a standard set of steps you need to take. First, you have to use getText functions to identify the strings in your code that you want to translate it. Second, you run a utility to extract those strings into a template file, typically called message.po. After that, you have to pro produce translation files based on messages.po. Ideally, another tool Ideally, by hiring a set of uh, hiring a set of translators, or perhaps by trusting Google Translate or similar tools. Third, use another tool to convert the translation files to the language-specific .mo format used by Get Text. For example, messages underscore en dot mo for the English version. Finally, you need to ship the folder with the .mo files in it along with your translation. There are various different tools available depending on the operating system. For Windows users, there are a couple of scripts in the tools slash i18n folder of your Python distributions. For Unix-like system, there are operating system utilities available that are Python aware. So this concludes this section.
And in this section, you saw the power of structuring applications in layers to separate out the data processing from the core or business logic and the presentation. In particular, you saw how you could build multiple user interfaces on top of the same core logic and data layers. In the process, you explore several variations of command line interfaces using different styles of user interaction and powerful command line options. You also saw how to build GUI applications using TakeInter, the standard GUI toolkit in Python, along with its ancillary, mo ancillary modules that offer more widgets and improved, and improved appearance. We concluded this exploration by building a significant user interface on top of an existing data layer using many of the features already explored, but using an object-oriented style rather than a procedural approach. And finally, we reviewed some alternative third-party GUI frameworks that often even more power than TakeInter should uh, than TakeInter should you wish to get more serious about GUI applications. And this section looked at some wider issues in building applications for other people to use. It covered the various types of known core data, such as configuration values that we can that you can store and the options available for each type. We also cover the use of Python logging module to record significant events and how we can manage the levels of logging and how it is stored. And we concluded this section with a look at the issues around localization application for the user. So this includes using localized setting for currency and time formats as well as different alphabets. Python supports Unicode character sets and uh, you can use the encode and decode methods to convert strings to and from their row bytes. And finally, we mentioned the get text mechanism for displaying different languages within your applications. So I hope you Google these modules and try it on your own because getting into the details of this is, uh, is, is out of scope for this course. So. I hope you enjoyed this section and uh, hopefully have given you some uh, testing ground and tipping your toe into the world of GUI. And in the next lex lesson, we are going to talk about uh, building for the web with Python. It's going to be a lot of fun interacting with the web with Python. So I'll see you in the next section.